did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, so he did not open his mouth. If you would, grab your Bibles or any electronic device which you have, a Bible app on. Uh, I encourage you to not get distracted if you're using uh, some device with your text messages or social media platforms and all of that, uh, tell them wait. I encourage them to join you. Right. But grab your Bibles, any electronic device you have, hold it up high and repeat after me. This is my Bible. The Word of God. And inside, God tells me the plans he has for my life. He tells me how much he loves me, even when this world tells me that I am not lovable, and I shall be all that God desires for me to be, because his Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. And this I proclaim in Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to share with you specifically about the Lamb of God. He is the reason why we celebrate not just on Resurrection Day, not just on a Sunday, not just at 10.30 a.m., but he's the reason why we should worship him Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 24 hours a day. Amen. Not just with our words, but with our thoughts, with our actions. He is the one who is worthy of worship. And believe me when I tell you, some may say I don't worship anyone. Well, that is impossible. Man is designed to worship. Man cannot help himself but to worship. But it does not mean that man chooses to worship rightly and worship God because many people worship the creations that God has made like the sun, the stars, the moon, Jupiter, Jaw, uh, uh, Mars, and so forth. Some people worship money, some people worship houses, some people worship fame, and some people worship themselves. Man was designed to worship. But I want to share with you today, and so if you would, from the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelations, chapter 5, and I ask that you read it with me, and we're going to, going to um, highlight two of these verses. I'm going to start at verse 1, and it says in Revelations 5, and uh, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And, and today I just want to talk with you just for a little while about man-made marks. Earlier when we were beginning to express our faith to the Lord through the Lord's Supper, I shared with you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your and my sins. It's the reason why I read to you as soon as the video went off from Isaiah chapter 53, verse seven. It is one of the places in the Old Testament where Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lamb of God. In fact, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God at least twice in the Old Testament, including the book of Jeremiah. Jesus Christ was prophesied to actually live not only a sinless life, but to die on the cross for your and my sins. Yes, Jesus is a gift from God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, for you and I. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and in our place. He is a gift that allows us to be put back into a rightful relationship with God the Father, a relationship that was severed when Adam, in the book of Genesis, Adam, was, Adam represents all mankind. He was created in the image of God, but when Adam sinned, Adam broke up the relationship that he had with God the Father. Now listen, this, remember earlier I was talking about position and fellowship. Adam had a position and he had fellowship with God. When Adam sinned, the relationship he had with God was severed and Adam lost not only his position, but also his ability to have fellowship with God. Amen. But God is so good. And none of it was a surprise to God. That God provided a gift. Now in the Old Testament, when a person sinned, they would make sacrifices. The sacrifice included a lamb, a lamb that had to be without a flaw, without a blemish, no spots. And that lamb was sacrificed on behalf of a person, a person's sins. But you know what? A person had to keep coming back. Why? Because we have a proclivity to sin. And it may have helped us fellowship-wise for a little while, but it did not keep us in a permanent position relationship-wise with God. God has a solution. The solution is in the person of God himself, God the Son, which is Jesus Christ. So God the Son, who was introduced to humanity in Bethlehem, when we, we talk about him being born in Bethlehem, that is the solution that God gave a perfect lamb, the lamb of God, without a spot, blemish, or wrinkle. 
And when he died on the cross, he provided us not only the uh, opportunity to uh, be in a permanent relationship with God, but he gave us an opportunity to have fellowship with him. This was prophesied about so many times throughout the Old Testament and including the New Testament. Well, some people thought that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and they buried him, they thought it was over. Oh, they thought it was over. In fact, they quickly found that wasn't true because hundreds of witnesses saw him. So many people came to rightfully believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. But I want to talk to you a little bit further, not just about his death, his burial, his resurrection, but I need you to know he did not get up just to get up to show off that he got up. But even right now, he's on the right hand of the Father because he returned back to his state of, his, his environment of glory. And you, you have to bear in mind when Jesus came here and dwelt amongst man, he put on humanity. He put on a uniform of humanity, but he's on the right hand of God the Father. And even now, he's interceding on your and my behalf. But he's not just interceding for us. He's also preparing a place for you and I. Oh, but that's not the end of it. He's also going to return, which means one has to be ready when he returns. We have to be in a relationship with God the Father, and the only way to be in a relationship with God the Father is through Jesus, because in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus Christ says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I don't want anyone to leave here saying, well, you know, I heard that preacher say, and I've heard it said many times that I have to accept Jesus Christ, but I have another way. I'm a really good person. I am a good person. I do right by people. I do right by my mama. I do right by my daddy. I do right by my siblings. I do right by my friends, my coworkers. And not only do I do right by people, I show up at work on time, five minutes ahead. I work hard. I give them more than they give me. Not only that, I serve in my community. I, I, I'm a community uh, activist. I help with all kinds of things. I volunteer my time. I also work at, listen, I work at the assistant living. I, I, I take care of little babies. I help the older ladies across the street. I do everything right. I don't lie even when it would be convenient for me. I go to church every Sunday. I dress the part. I put on the shoes. I put on the outfit. I groom. I prepare myself to go to church. I sing songs that are called gospel songs, Christian songs. I know scriptures. But let me warn you, Satan knows scripture. He blurred and blended it on a few occasions. The only reason he was able to blur and blend it was because he knew the real deal. So you got to know the real thing in order to make a counterfeit something. You, some say, I know songs. Just because you know a song doesn't mean you know the person that you're singing about. Just because you know scripture doesn't mean that you know who the scripture is talking about. Just because you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and was buried and rose from the grave does not mean that you have put your faith, faith is a combination of belief and trust in him. So knowing about him is not going to give you access to God the Father. No matter how much you know, and you can have a, listen, you can have a seminary degree. You do not go to heaven because you have a bachelor's or a master's or a, a, a doctorate degree in theology of divinity. Not those things. You have to have a relationship 
with the Father, and the only way to have a relationship with the Father is according to by going through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Putting your faith in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and my sins. Well, why did he die on the cross for you and my sins? Because we are sinners. Yes. Yes. And you may not have robbed a bank. You may not have even stolen a pack of nail laters. You may not have lied. You may not have lusted. You may not have did this. And by the way, I'm going to let you know, you have lied. Because if you say you are without sin, you are lying now. So one needs Jesus Christ. God provided Jesus Christ. Sacrificial lamb, perfect, without a spot, without a blemish. He is the lamb of God. I want you to know that according to this text, I'm just going to walk through it. Listen, just, I'm just, listen I, if you really want to journey with us through Revelation, join us on Wednesday at 10, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock to 11.30. Join us. We're walking slowly through Revelation. It might take you a whole week or two to get through one verse. Just, 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 but, but walk with us. But I just want to tell you this, because this right here, this, this, this impacts all of us. See, verses 1 through 5, notice it said that no one was found in heaven. They had a problem up in heaven. And, and the problem was the right hand of the throne, there was a book, a scroll. It was, it was written, had writing on the inside and, of it and on the back side of it. It was a scroll. The scroll had seven seals on it. Don't think of a scroll that has seven marks going across it. I want you to think of a scroll that as you, it's got one seal on it, and as you start to unroll it, it has another seal on it. You roll it further, there's another seal on it, and you continue until all seven seals are open. This was a technique that the Romans used when it came to very important documents, such as a marriage license or a property uh, exchange or someone going, uh, being served off or sold off or a property being sold off, but it was for major contracts, and they would take this scroll and put a seal on it, roll it up some, put a seal on it, roll it up further, put a seal on it, seven times, seven times. And the problem is, an angel proclaimed with a loud voice, who is worthy to open and to break its seals? But no one in heaven, think about it, in heaven or on earth, under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Now, God the Father is on the throne holding this scroll. An angel asks who is worthy to open it. But once again, no one in heaven, no one on earth, and no one under the earth. That means all of the religious leaders from time past and current, Abraham couldn't open it. David, King David, couldn't open it. Job could not open it. Paul, Peter, James, and John could not open it. None of the Old Testament, none of the New Testament, and none of our current leaders, Billy Graham could not open it. No one could open this scroll, and that was a problem. It, was a, it caused a dilemma. Who, listen, the question wasn't who is willing to open it because there's enough foolish people in this room to be willing to try. <laughs> the question is, who is worthy? There is no political leader that was worthy, there was no religious leader that was worthy, and even though m m you know, we look up to grandma and mama and daddy and our little baby, no one was found worthy. And this broke John's heart. John, is the human author that God used to, to, to transcribe this. The author John, not John the Baptist. And John, he's seeing this vision, and John, he began to cry, and cry greatly because no one was found worthy. He knew this is bad. But one of the elders, one of the 24 elders, they, 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 they said to John, hey, stop weeping. Stop your cry. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And 
uh, this is a prophetic statement that goes back to Genesis and it goes back, goes back to Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 and it goes back to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and it's a, so it's pointing back because Jesus would be a further offspring from the root of Jesse yet Jesus also still predated Jesse even though he was offspring because Jesus has always existed. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1. Uh, this is chapter 1. And God said, let us create man in our image. God is not talking to himself. He's talking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So the three of them are conversing. Well, the elder says, don't weep. And he says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Oh, I love this. Because yes. John's looking around for the lion. Where's that lion? Where's that lion of Judah? Because all of Jerusalem, the, the, the Jews, they were looking for the Messiah to come like a lion and put the Romans under their feet. But as John looked around, he found the lamb. And the lamb was in the mess. The lamb had always been there, but John had been so caught up by the thunderings and the lightnings and the glory that was in heaven, the, the emerald lights. He was so caught up in the worship that was taking place amongst the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim and the 24 elders and the sea of glass of believers that was worshiping and the mighty throne with all of the lights illuminating like it, from it like a rainbow. He was so caught up by all of the sound and the sights that he had missed the lamb. And the lamb was in the midst. And if you go back and look at the original word of the lamb, it means little lamb. It doesn't mean baby lamb, but little lamb. And it was this lamb. He, he's looking at this lamb. I, I, I thought it was going to be a lion. And here's the lamb. I want you to know something. Two times in the Old Testament, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. Twice in the, Old, in the New Testament, he's referred to also as the Lamb of God. In John chapter uh, 1, verses 29 and 36, he's also referred to the Lamb once in the book of Acts chapter 8. He's also referred to as the Lamb once in one of the epistles in 1 Peter chapter 1. But in the book of Revelations, he's referred to as the Lamb of God 28 times. In fact, in this chapter alone, John's going to mention him four times after this verse because he can't keep his eyes off of him now. And the lamb comes meek because, you know what? Jesus has always restrained back and held back to demonstrate himself as one that you can come to, one that is humble and low. The humble servant. But I want you to notice something about this lamb. He had seven, notice this, seven horns, seven eyes. You see that? Those seven horns, the horn in the Bible represents power. It's often, and he has seven. The seven represents the number of completion or all, meaning he has all power. He has seven eyes. The eyes means that he can see. But he has seven, which means he can see all things, which means he's omniscient. He sees and knows all things. I know each and every last one of you. I know what you were doing last night. I know what you were doing this morning. In fact, not only did I know what you were doing, but I knew what you were doing before you thought about what you were thinking about. I know you. I see all things. He's the Lamb of God. He demonstrated himself as the Lamb of God. But watch, he goes further. It says, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Only the Lamb of God, the Son of God, was worthy to take the scroll from the God the Father. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures, which are cherubim, a special group of angels and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Oh, I get excited about this. They started to worship Jesus. Now, some people say, well, hold up. Why are they worshiping him? Because he's God. 
He's God the Son. If someone ever told you Jesus is not God, then why are they worshiping God the Son when God the Father is right there and if to worship anyone else but God the Father according to the text would be a form of blasphemy which is a sin but God the Father is pleased with the worship of God the Son. And they bowed down and started to worship him, the elders and the cherubim, but I want you to notice something. They started to sing a new song. It's a song that has not yet been sung. Here's, here's the thing. They didn't know the song, but they got a new song. And in just a moment, watch, other people join in. I mean, others join in in the new song, not people, beings. So you got the elders. You got the cherubim. And they began to sing this new song. And, and in verse, let me just go right here. Worthy are you to take the book. And to break his seal, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Now notice something. They said, you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now go back to verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Did you miss something? There was a lamb standing. Did you not hear that Jesus Christ died on the cross? And they buried him. And some thought it was over. But the text says... Here he was, standing. If you're dead, you don't stand. He's standing, but notice something else. It says he's standing, and yet it says as if slain, he has the marks of the crucifixion on him. Remember, you may... If you don't know, there was a disciple of Jesus that says, I, I won't believe Jesus has risen from the grave unless I see for myself. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, Jesus said, hey, here I am. And on top of that, I know you. And he said, I, I won't believe it unless I get to touch his wound. And Jesus said, touch these holes. T -t touch the wounds. T touch it. Thomas, Doubting Thomas. Touch it. Touch. And here Jesus was in heaven. And I got to thinking. You know, God created the heavens and the earth. And there's nothing in heaven that man made. Except one thing. These marks that are on the lamb. These are the man-made marks. The only thing in heaven that man made was the marks that are on the lamb of God. And here Jesus is in heaven still displaying the marks because those marks that the world thought what meant he was over became beauty marks. Now, it may not be so beautiful to some, but it's beautiful to those who have accepted Jesus Christ because those marks, I want you to know, if you're a child of God or if you're considering accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I need you to know that those marks that are on the Lamb of God, they actually communicate that those are the marks that he took for you and me. That's the part, listen, those marks were meant for you and I. Those marks are the result of dying on the cross. They were meant for you and I. And here Jesus is in heaven. He's proudly wearing those beauty marks. There are man-made marks, but those man-made marks made it possible for man to be in a relationship with God the Father. And so they saw him. They sung, and look how the text closed. And then I looked, verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing, notice this now, Every created thing, because remember the text started off saying there was no one found worthy in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. But notice these things that were in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Watch what they do. It says, and every created thing which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all the things in them, I heard saying, 
to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever, which means all of the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, all of the elders of the church. It means that all of the uh, church, the, 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 the church that was ratcheted up, it, it means that all of the 144,000, it meant that all of those who were martyred, it means that even here on earth that the cat, the dog, the mouse, the rat, the cow, the pig, the chicken, the hawk, they all started to worship him, but also all of the fish in the sea, the whale, the shark, listen, all of them started to, listen, even the octopus, they, listen, the octopus is even waving his eight arms celebrating Jesus Christ, but even the spiders and even those detestable roaches, they started to worship Jesus. Everything in heaven and on earth, and watch this, and even under the earth. They started to worship him because even unbelievers are going to have to bow down, surrender, listen, in, in admitting that he is Lord, even if it's too late for them. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And watch how it closes. Verse 14, and the four living creatures guardians of the throne ministering to God with their two, three pairs they, got, they have six wings three pairs upper, middle, bottom bottom wings they use to cover their feet their dirty feet they had wings in the middle to cover the middle part and to move they had wings on the upper part of their body just wondering. And guess what they do? They just start worshiping Jesus. And they all start saying over and over, Amen! Amen! In other words, we're all in agreement. We are all in agreement. We all agree. All of heaven, all of earth, we agree yes, sir. Amen. that He is the Lamb of God, that He is worthy to be worshiped. And it's the reason why Resurrection Sunday is so sweet. Because He not only got up from the grave, but we can count on the fact that he's going to be returning. He's going to be returning. We can be excited by the fact that those marks that are displayed on him, that he choose to wear like a badge of honor, is because he loves you and I. And so, if you don't mind, with all eyes closed and all heads bowed, we're going to continue to worship, but I want you to worship through response. Just want you to respond. One, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. But I want you to know that the altar is a place where you can come and kneel and pray I also want you to know that this church would love to see you if you're not in a relationship with God the Father through His Son Jesus Christ which is the only way we would love to see you take advantage of that opportunity today so I'm going to ask you to do this with all eyes closed all heads bowed you have heard that it is necessary to admit that we are a sinner it is necessary to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins. And the Bible says that if we confess Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord of our life, putting our faith in Him, the Bible says that we will be saved. No strings attached if we genuinely come to Him. So with all eyes closed and all heads bowed, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have accepted Jesus Christ. But first, let me pray. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, for that person or those persons who are making a decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray, dear Lord, that they would be bold enough to just raise their hand above their head. And Father, I pray, dear Lord, that you would just uh, guide them and, and prevent them, Father, from being distracted by a person sitting next to them. I pray, Father, that you prevent them from feeling ashamed, but to act in, a, in an expression of boldness, dear Lord, just as boldly as you demonstrate those marks on your body, demonstrating your love for us. 
And Lord, I pray, Father, for those who are seeking, already in a relationship with you, but who are seeking to come closer to you in fellowship. We pray for those also. It's in Christ Jesus' name. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today, would you just raise your hand above? We're going to close this worship gathering with baptism, but I would like you to know before we go into uh, this next time of worship, I just want to tell you that 12 people raised their hands to accept Jesus Christ. Woo!